The Mafia Commission Trial, which took place from February 1985 to November 1986, was the greatest blow to La Cosa Nostra in their history. Eleven organized crime figures, including the heads of New York's so-called Five Families, were indicted by United States Attorney Rudolph Giuliani under the Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, or RICO, on charges including extortion, labor racketeering, and murder. Eight were convicted. It marked the start of a dramatic decline for the Mafia. From their peak in the 1950s to the 1980s, they quickly became a pale shadow of the organization that had dominated illegal, and in some cases legal, commerce and politics in the U.S. The Mafia Commission was formed in 1931, the brainchild of Charles Lucky Luciano, following a violent series of mob wars. His vision of a ruling body that would settle disputes before wars erupted ushered in an era of prosperity for organized crime. Originally consisting of New York's five families, as well as those of Chicago and Buffalo, by 1985, power was centered on the five families of New York, with Chicago administering its own sphere of influence. The commission case began in 1983, when the FBI made recordings of Colombo family labor racketeer Ralph Scopo extorting money from contractors. Large contracts could not be gained in New York without payoffs to labor unions, which were mob-dominated. Contracts between $2 million and $15 million were reserved for a club of contractors called the Concrete Club, which were selected by the commission. In return, the chosen firms gave a 2% kickback of the contract value to the commission. In some cases, the mob had hidden interests in Concrete Club members. Fat Tony Salerno, commission representative for the Genovese family, had controlling interest in two major concrete operators. Tony Dux Corallo, head of the Lucchese family, unwittingly helped to bury his fellow defendants. During a parallel investigation into his stranglehold on the garbage collection business in Staten Island, the New York State Organized Crime Task Force had managed to bug the car of his driver, Sal Avellino. Over an extended period, Corallo blabbed everything there was to know to his protege, Avellino. It was manna from heaven for the authorities. On the 25th of February, 1985, Salerno, Corallo, Bonanno boss Philip Rusty Rustelli, and Big Paul Castellano, boss of the Gambino crime family and the most powerful mobster in the country, were arrested. Carmine Jr. Persico, boss of the Colombo crime family, was added to the indictment later. Six major subordinates of the bosses were also arrested. All pleaded not guilty, as the procedural business of pretrial ground on through the summer of 1985. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel, and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. Just before Christmas of the same year, the trial would be shaken up in a spectacular way. On the 16th of December, Big Paul Castellano and his underboss, Tommy Bellotti, pulled up to Sparks Steakhouse on East 46th Street in Manhattan. Stepping out of the car, Castellano and Bellotti were assassinated in a legendary mob hit. When the trial resumed, it was obvious to the defendant's lawyers that the evidence against them was damning. Seeking plea bargains, they found Prosecutor Giuliani unyielding. He demanded that the defendants plead guilty to the stiffest charges in the indictment, which carried sentences 
that would have all but assured they would die in prison. Persico represented himself, and did so well that the judge praised his defence of himself in his summing up. But Persico's strategy infuriated the other defendants. He planned to admit the existence of the Mafia, but deny that he was a leader of it, and deny involvement in criminality. It was the only feasible strategy in light of the evidence, and the other defendants grudgingly agreed to follow it, provided they themselves didn't have to personally admit the Mafia existed, and thereby break the code of Omerta. It didn't do any good, though. Eight defendants were convicted, including the four remaining bosses of New York, all of whom got 100 years. All but Persico were in their late 60s and 70s at the time, an effective life sentence. Salerno, Corallo and Rustelli were all dead by 2000. Persico died in prison in 2019. Soon after the trial, Salerno was revealed not to be the boss of the Genovese family, as they operated a front boss policy to confuse authorities. It didn't change his conviction. The commission trial, and its use of the RICO Act, was the beginning of the end for the mob. Following trials decimated its structure, and the stiff sentences ensured that mafiosi turning government witness which used to be a rarity, became the norm. La Cosa Nostra today is in the shadows, merely existing where it once dominated. In today's society, where anything goes and corruption seems to be the norm, it is perhaps a lot easier and a lot more profitable to be dishonest on the right side of the law. One hundred years after his death, Liverpool cotton merchant James Maybrick shot into the headlines when a diary emerged, supposedly written by him, detailing his criminal life as Jack the Ripper. The document was first brought to light by Michael Barrett, a Liverpool scrap metal dealer. Barrett's story of how he came to be in possession of it was bizarre claiming that it had been given to him in a bar by a friend. In any case, the diary was made into a book that was published in 1993 to widespread derision. A few ripper buffs were open-minded, but attention turned to the testing of the original document. Chromatography revealed that the ink used was commercially available at the time of the killings, the notebook itself was Victorian, though it was suspicious that 20 pages at the front had been torn out. The handwriting style was said to be more 20th century than 19th. In January 1995, Barrett swore an affidavit that he had, in fact, written the diary himself. Almost immediately, he withdrew the affidavit. To this day, some claim that the diary may be genuine, although the vast majority of Ripper experts are convinced that it's a hoax. Even if we were to assume that the diary is not genuine, which is not 100% certain, why would the hoaxers choose a long-forgotten Liverpool cotton merchant as its subject? Is there any evidence that Maybrick was ever suspected, or had any involvement in the Whitechapel murders? According to the diary, Maybrick killed prostitutes in Whitechapel because of rage at his wife. She had taken a lover, who she had been seen with in an area of Liverpool that was also known as Whitechapel. Whilst this seems a rather thin and convenient link, his wife did have an affair. Maybrick's marriage to her was rocky to say the least. According to records, he did blacken her eye on at least one occasion. Violence against women was not beyond him. He was also addicted to arsenic following a bout with malaria in the US, a situation which reportedly exacerbated an already fiery temper. 
As far as Whitechapel in London goes, Maybrick was familiar with it, having lived in the East End in the past. As a cotton merchant, he travelled very often from Liverpool to the capital. The fact that he spent so much time doing so is frustrating. No one seems to know where he was on the dates of the murders, and while this doesn't rule him out, nor does it rule him in. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel, and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. During the investigation into another suspect, Francis Tumblety, the story of the Batty Street Lodger came to light. Newspaper articles of the time depicted a man who fled shortly after one of the murders, leaving behind bloody clothes. The man was said to be American, and had arrived in London from Liverpool. Whilst the connection to Liverpool is intriguing, the American part seemed to rule Maybrick out. And yet, Maybrick had spent several years living in the US before the murders. Could he have been mistaken by the locals for an American? Another piece of evidence that possibly fingered Maybrick was a crime scene photo at the murder site of Mary Kelly, the last generally accepted Ripper victim. Scrawled on the wall of her room were the initials FM, written in the victim's blood. After Maybrick's emergence as a suspect, some Ripperologists immediately speculated that the FM represented Florence Maybrick, James's wife. This is certainly well worth considering, but could just as easily stand for something else. Less than six months after the final murder, Maybrick was dead. Florence Maybrick was initially convicted of his murder by poisoning, at a trial which received heavy criticism for a lack of impartiality. After much public sympathy, and revelations that Maybrick had been self-medicating with dangerous drugs, she was eventually released in 1904. All that aside, Maybrick's death does fit the timeline for a murderer who stopped because they were unable to carry on. Was he Jack the Ripper? As with all other suspects, there's very little to connect him with the case, or if there was, the passage of time has destroyed it. Unlike the others, we have an alleged confession. It is more likely a forgery than genuine, but no one has yet proved that beyond question. In June 1993, another intriguing piece of alleged evidence surfaced. A collector named Albert Johnson purchased an antique gold watch, on the inside of which he found scratched the initials of Jack the Ripper's five victims, together with the signature, J. Maybrick, and the words, I am Jack. Skeptics were suspicious of the sudden appearance of the watch. Experts at the University of Manchester and Bristol University concluded that the markings were older than subsequent natural scratches. While not dating the markings conclusively, they did say they were many tens of years old. Their conclusions have been disputed, but not disproved. Maybrick divides Ripper scholars fiercely, and has more detractors than supporters. It may be that the diary that was supposed to prove his guilt weighs more heavily against him than anything else. But there is just enough there to make him a fascinating suspect. Until it has been conclusively proved that the tangible items he supposedly left behind are indeed hoaxes, we simply cannot rule out that the madman who slashed through Whitechapel in the late summer and autumn of 1888 was indeed James Maybrick. The Bluff Cove Air Attacks 
took place on the 8th of June 1982, during the Falklands War. It was an attempt by the Argentine Air Force to stop British troop ships from unloading the forces that would eventually recapture the capital of the islands, Port Stanley. By the 1st of June, the British had successfully landed 5,000 troops of the 5th Infantry Brigade on the islands, after the 2nd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment discovered that the Argentinians had not defended Bluff Cove. It was decided that units of the Welsh and Scots Guards would be sent in to bolster the original force. However, Atlantic Conveyor, a requisitioned merchant ship used to carry troops, had been sunk on the 25th of May by an Argentine Exocet missile attack. Troop transport now fell to ships of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, which were crewed by civilian sailors. Though Bluff Cove had been conceded to the British without a fight, 602 Commando Company, an Argentine Special Forces unit, had dug in on nearby Mount Harriet to observe the British build-up. On observing the ships arriving and unloading on the 8th of June, they called in an airstrike. Two waves of A-4 Skyhawk fighter bombers from the Argentine Air Force's 5th Air Brigade departed from Rio Gallegos Air Base, each loaded with three 500-pound retarding tail bombs. Three Skyhawks were forced to return to base due to refueling issues, leaving five from the original group to continue. Six Argentine Dagger fighters simultaneously took off from the airbase at Rio Grande to provide support. One of the Daggers was similarly forced back to base by refueling issues. Before the attack group left, four Mirage III fighters took off from Rio Grande. It was a decoy mission to draw away the British Sea Harriers from the attack zone allowing the Skyhawks and Daggers to carry out their attacks without threat of being attacked themselves. In addition, the Argentine destroyer Santissima Trinidad broadcast interference signals to jam the frequency used by the Royal Navy's air controllers who directed Sea Harrier operations. It was an excellent plan. However, the British still had a chance to avert disaster. Their nuclear submarines were an ace in the hole throughout the entire conflict. HMS Valiant was monitoring Rio Grande and tracked the six Dagger fighters from takeoff. But their warning message never reached the British forces at Bluff Cove. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. At 2 p.m. local time, the first strike took place. Two Royal Fleet Auxiliary ships, Sir Galahad and Sir Tristram, were struck and badly damaged. Three bombs struck Sir Galahad and two Sir Tristram. Forty-eight men died aboard Sir Galahad, thirty-two Welsh guards, eleven other military personnel, and five crewmen. The attack on Sir Tristram killed two crewmen. At 4.50 p.m., the second wave of Skyhawks attacked Bluff Cove, but this time, Sea Harriers were waiting for them. After striking a landing barge, with the loss of six Royal Marines, the Skyhawks were attacked by Harrier pilot Flight Lieutenant David Morgan. He shot down two of them, while his wingman took care of another. The pilots of all three were killed. The fourth Skyhawk sustained damage, but was able to make it home. In a separate attack, the frigate HMS Plymouth was bombed by the daggers from Rio Grande. Five crewmen were injured, and though the ship was badly damaged, it survived. The 56 servicemen killed and 150 injured, was the greatest loss of life sustained by the British Army since World War II, and represented one-fifth 
of the total British deaths in the conflict. Sir Galahad had to be scuttled. Sir Tristram was rebuilt following the war. Though the attack was a great success for Argentina, at least until the loss of the planes at the end, it didn't achieve what had been hoped. The Argentinians assumed that several hundred troops had been killed, an outcome which would have stung as badly as their loss of the General Belgrano. Instead, the British build-up was delayed by only two days, and the defeat seemed to stiffen morale rather than weaken it. Just six days later, the British had swept through the island and taken Port Stanley, and the Argentinians had surrendered. After the war, a memorial for the British soldiers killed in the attack was erected at Fitzroy, near the Cove, along with a separate memorial to the ship's crew who lost their lives. A survivor of the attack, Welsh Guardsman Simon Weston, became the subject of a documentary, which followed his painful road to recovery. He received 46% burns, rendering his face initially unrecognisable, even to his relatives. After enduring 96 operations and procedures, his condition has now improved remarkably. He's renowned for his charity work and advocacy on behalf of veterans. In a later documentary, he travelled to Argentina to meet with Carlos Cachon, the pilot who bombed his ship. Cachon then visited Weston's home in Liverpool, and the two men became great friends. That friendship is a fitting tribute to all the casualties of the Falklands War, and it proves that while those who start wars are rarely men of honour, those who fight them almost always are. Briax was a Canadian group of companies whose Calgary-based minerals division, Briax Minerals Limited, was responsible for one of the biggest scandals in stock market history. Briax Minerals Limited was founded in 1989 by Canadian businessman David Walsh, who had previously found success in the oil and gas industry in North America. The company was relatively unproductive until 1993, when Walsh was advised by a geologist, John Felderhoff, to buy a property in the middle of a jungle near the Busang River in Kalimantan, Indonesia. The site's project manager, Filipino geologist Michael de Guzman, originally estimated that gold reserves there amounted to 2 million ounces. Over time, the estimates increased to 30 million ounces in 1995, 60 million ounces in 1996, and finally, in 1997, 70 million ounces. A vast find. The company's stock, originally only listed on Alberta's Provincial Exchange, moved to Toronto's TSX and the Nasdaq in 1996. Not surprisingly, the colossal reported fines on the company's new project sent the stock price into the stratosphere to a peak above $280 in 1997. Such was the frenzy. Major banks and investment houses flocked to get involved. Major companies contemplated takeover bids, with the company valued at over $7 billion in today's money. The Indonesian government, then under the control of the spectacularly corrupt President Suharto, also wanted a piece of the action. After much negotiation, it was agreed that Briax would retain 45% of the profits from the venture. The remainder was to be split between mining giant Freeport McMoran, who would run the mine, and the family and cronies of Suharto. After the deal was announced on the 17th of February 1997, Freeport McMoran began their due diligence of the site, and with that, the alarm bells would soon begin to ring.
There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel, and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. On the 19th of March, 1997, the aforementioned Michael de Guzman reportedly committed suicide by jumping from a helicopter in Indonesia. Four days later, a body was recovered, but missing the hands and feet. Animal predation had further complicated matters. When identification was claimed, it was only via a tooth and a thumbprint. Journalist John Macbeth, who investigated the scandal, claimed that a body had disappeared from the morgue in the town the helicopter had taken off from. The supposed remains of de Guzman were found only 400 metres from a logging road and were only seen by another Filipino geologist. Macbeth further asserted that de Guzman was a bigamist, and one of the women who claimed to be married to him continued to receive anonymous monthly payments from someone long after the geologist's supposed death. A week later, Freeport McMoran announced that its own due diligence core samples, led by Australian geologist Colin Jones, showed, quote, insignificant amounts of gold. Panic selling of the company's stock ensued. Suhardo cancelled the deal, while Briex demanded more tests and reviews of the samples. Strathcona Minerals, another mining firm, was brought in to give a second opinion. Their results came on the 4th of May and left no one in any doubt. The Busang samples had been salted with gold dust, in some cases gold shaved from jewellery. Even if the samples had been genuine, they never came close to the quantities that had been claimed by de Guzman. Trading in Briax was suspended, and the company filed for bankruptcy protection. Angry investors demanded answers, and lawsuits began to fly. The head of the Toronto Stock Exchange resigned. Several public sector pension funds lost tens of millions in the crash. Briax formally went bankrupt, on the 5th of November, 1997. David Walsh always professed his innocence and moved to the Bahamas in 1998. Shortly after moving there, two masked gunmen broke into his home and demanded his money. Three weeks later, on the 4th of June, 1998, Walsh died of a brain aneurysm. To his credit, Walsh had called in the RCMP as soon as the fraud became apparent, and supposedly had no knowledge of the shenanigans in Indonesia. The RCMP investigation ended with no charges. But in 1999, Felderhoff was charged with insider trading by the Ontario Securities Commission. The case would drag on through the courts for years, eventually ending in a 2007 acquittal for Felderhoff. A class action lawsuit by investors also faltered. There was simply no money available from Briex to justify its continuance. Prior to the scandal, professional geology in Canada was unregulated. This was amended so that Briex could never happen again. At least, not in terms of unsubstantiated claims of mineral deposits. As long as greed, the lifeblood of con men, is alive and well. Another Briax, with a different kind of fool's gold, will inevitably happen in the future.